on Tech News Today, computer glitches halted the New York Stock Exchange and grounded United Airlines flights today. Plus, Meerkat friends Facebook, and we'll tell you why Google's Nest thermostat is really a law-abiding robot. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, July 8th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Our co-anchor today is ZDNet contributing writer Kevin Tofel. Kevin, how the heck are you? I am good as always, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm, I just moved, and now we're living on a farm. It's like Wonderful. So, so great. It is so great. I am loving it. And... Uh, yeah, and we have a lot. We've we've harvested a lot of stories today as well. Speaking of farming metaphors, so why don't we jump right into it? Uh, the big news today, well, two two sort of semi-related stories. Trading was temporarily stopped on the New York Stock Exchange floor today because of some technical issues. Cyber terrorism was ruled out. The Nasdaq reported no problems. It's unclear whether this was in any any way related to the crashing of the Chinese stock market ca caused by a sell-off, which the government was unable to halt. Also, United Airlines grounded all flights today for about two hours after experiencing what the company said was a network connectivity issue and what the Federal Aviation Administration described as an automation issue. So we don't know if it was uh, network connectivity or automation, but it was an issue. Similar situation happened to the airline June 2nd. Uh, Kevin Tofel, I don't think these things are related, but it does point to the fact that these weird little computer glitches, when they're connected into these big systems, can cause all kinds of havoc, uh, delay things, uh, make everybody lose lots and lots of money, and it's uh, really problematic. Um, do you have any thoughts on this other than uh, the fact that this kind of stuff happens and they just happen to happen within a couple of hours of each other this morning? Yeah, it's easy for people to just assume these are all related uh, incidents, and I totally understand that it, from what we're hearing from the NYSE and other uh, you know, sources, they're not related at all, and they're not cyber attacks. Um, for my part, I did tell the NYSC to reboot that Raspberry Pi that they run everything nice. on, but nice. they didn't listen to me. Yeah, yeah, and I and I can't speak to to United, which uh, they have a hub right here in my backyard in Philadelphia. So, uh, you know, I fly them often, and never had this problem before. But uh, yeah, I mean, these systems we rely on them heavily, and they rely on a lot of data and connectivity and power and so on, a lot of moving parts there, and these things just they happen. I'm always afraid that when uh, the New York Stock Exchange makes a big deal out of saying, no, this wasn't cyber terrorism, that the cyber terrorists are like, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't we figure that out? So, just yeah, We don't need ideas. to give them any more ideas, no, I, I don't think, on that front. All right, we've got some more news coming right up. But first, I want to talk about Gazelle. Here's a question for you. How often should people like you and me, people who love gadgets and technology, upgrade our smartphones? How often? Every two years, as the carriers suggest, every year. Personally, I think that every twice a year is about right. And, of course, this sounds uh, excessive and wasteful on its face, but, in fact, if you're using Gazelle, it is not at all. The, the worst thing you can do is buy a brand-new phone and then throw away your old phone or just put it in, in a box somewhere and just let it uh, sort of decay uh, because, essentially, the manufacturing process of making a new phone is very wasteful. It's very harmful to the environment it's very problematic. But when you sell your device to Gazelle, that phone is going to very quickly, it'll be refurbished and, and made beautiful again, and it will be put into the hands of somebody who will love it as much as you uh, love it. And that person will be buying a pre-owned device instead of a new one. So if you are enthusiastic about technology and you want to have the latest and greatest device out there, Gazelle can help you do it. And I don't think... We should feel any guilt at all about upgrading twice a year. Uh, it's just, you know, if this is our enthusiasm and smartphones are so useful and they come out with so many new, great new products all the time, that Gazelle can make it something that is feasible to do. Just go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E dot com and check out the prices that they will pay for your device. Of course, if you've got a pretty new, if you get the, a, a phone right when it ships, 
and then sell it to Gazelle six months later, you're going to recoup almost, you know, a huge uh, percentage of what you paid for that phone initially. So you may end up only paying ultimately, I don't know, 100 bucks, 150 bucks for the use of that phone for six months. It's a trivial price to pay for, you know, to have a really great brand new, the latest and greatest phone that's out there, I think. And so, you know, you want to check it out and see what prices they're paying. It's really quite astonishing. And uh, I highly recommend upgrading twice a year and using Gazelle every single time. Find out what your iPhone's worth. Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out and, you know, explore your passion for smartphones. Try an Android, try, a, try a, an iPhone, try something else. Uh, uh, Gazelle will make that possible. Well, in, uh, in uh, other news, Google's Nest uh, smart thermostat is actually uh, contains a really interesting bit of code that makes it what you might call a law-abiding robot. The Daily Dot reporter Mike Wenner joins us to explain all of this. Welcome to you, Mike. Hey, Mike. How's it going? It's going great, thank you. Now, before we get into your story, can you briefly describe what the Nest smart thermostat is and what makes it so smart? Sure. Uh, well, the thermostat itself is, um, you know, it's it, it's designed to learn from your habits and things like that um, uh, to control the temperature in your home uh, when it's uh, it 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 can detect, you know, when you're when you're home when you're not uh, cool off your house when you're not home um, in the uh, in the winter time if your heat's on and uh, just generally save you money. Um, and uh, it, it also looks quite nice, which is you know a, a bonus. It's uh, it, it's got the touchscreen interface, and it's you know, it's a generally uh, pretty sexy little piece of technology. Um, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, I would I would agree with you, Mike. I have one uh, here in the house installed, and it looks really nice. Now, tell us about this Easter egg that you found, and I'm really curious why you went looking for it, or how you determined <laughs> to to even check for this. It's really an, an interesting story. So, uh, so I was doing a story on on uh, the Nest thermostat, and I was looking for some information on an older model of it, and I, I hit up the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, and um, it, it wouldn't let me detect, or it wouldn't let me go back to a previous version of the page, and I, it, it directed me to the robots.txt uh, document on the website uh, that prevents search engines and archival tools from cataloging certain parts of the website. And just for whatever reason, I decided to bring it up, and as soon as I brought it up, I noticed that uh, it, you know, it contained a little, a little Easter egg there that, uh, that I don't think that anybody had discovered previously. Um, it's, uh, it's the three laws, uh, by Isaac Asimov, um, you know, hearkening back to his, uh, the iRobot novel and some of his previous works. And, uh, yeah, you know, it has nothing to do with the website itself. Those of course aren't, aren't parts of the website, but whoever designed this, this document, hit it in there. Um, it's been in there since October of 2012. And to my knowledge, nobody stumbled upon its existence. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty neat. So I decided to, you know, I, at first I didn't know if if it was too obscure to even uh, write about. I was like, this is kind of just this weird little thing that's here. But, uh, you know, people seem to be uh, really enjoy it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's I think it is uh, definitely uh, interesting to talk about because, Television shows are starting to uh, refer to this now. It's become a mass phenomenon, not just for uh, science fiction nerds. And, uh, for example, the the show Humans, uh, it, I have recently started watching. This involves uh, human-like uh, robots, almost indistinguishable from people. They can essentially pass for people in society. And they've been programmed with these very laws designed to, you know, they may not... Uh, what, what are the laws? They, they can't harm humans. What are the other two? So... The laws are, uh, the, the first law is that a robot cannot harm a human or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. The second law is that it must obey all human orders as long as that does not conflict with the first law. So you couldn't, for example, tell a robot to kill another human. And the third law is that a robot must protect itself uh, as long as that does not conflict with the first or second laws. So if a human were to order a robot to kill itself, it could do that, or it, it would have to do that as long as that didn't. Uh, you know, by that action, cause a human to come to harm. And this is especially hilarious because, of course, a robot.txt file is a, it's a text file designed to, uh, you know, essentially that search engine spiders go looking for because it tells them what to not uh, index and so on. And one of the commands is a disallow. So they played it straight. They said disallow, harming humans, disallow. So it's, it was really uh, hilarious in, in that sense. 
Um, and have you have you noticed? Um, is it common for robot.txt files to be used for Easter eggs? I'm I've, I'm not familiar with very many cases like this. Um, it, it, depending on the site, yeah. Um, you know, you never really know who is coming up with who is who's the, you know on the back end of the website uh, putting these things in place. Um, Nike uh, has been known to include uh, not only you know, their own logos and sayings and things like that, but like ASCII images and art in their, uh, in their robot.txt files. Some of them are completely boring. Um, you know, Google's is Google's itself is just a huge list of stuff that its own search engines, you know, wouldn't want to archive because it would just, you know, it would cause all kinds of havoc. Um, but yeah, some of these sites, uh, you know, people just love adding little things in there. And, and I, I love the fact that it, it called back to, you know, something that's decades old when um, when the company itself is really, you know, pushing the forefront of technology and stuff. It, it, it was it was cool to see. Mike, obviously, this is, you know, just an Easter egg inside joke, and it's a great nod to Asimov's three laws of robotics, you know, but I'm thinking ahead and, and thinking back to earlier just on the show where we talked about, you know, systems crashing and so on. You know, you got to think about the, the smart home market and the Internet of Things market in the future. You know, should people be concerned? I mean, we're going to need our houses to work. Um, I don't expect our houses to actually, you know, harm us or anything. But, you know, in the future, do you think there should be any concerns for that? Um, I think that I think that at present, uh, the technology is still not to the point where we would have to worry about, you know, instituting standards across the board, like like something like the three laws. Um, even in a, you know, of course not in a sense that your house is going to kill you or that your smart car is going to kill you or anything like that. But I think that in the future, you know, eventually we're going to have to come up with some kind of a standard to keep, uh, you know, all the companies on the same level in terms of what they're allowed to, uh, program their different gadgets. And I mean, robots in, themselves to, uh, you know, keep them from doing things that, would harm us or, you know, cause us a, a headache in any other way. It makes me think of uh, the 1984 novel uh, Neuromancer from William Gibson, where he depicted a case in which a home automation device, which I believe was some sort of gardening equipment, executed uh, somebody on behalf of the artificial intelligence uh, 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 entity uh, in that novel. So, uh, yeah, we, we need these rules for home automation for sure, uh, if William Gibson is right, which he was about almost everything. Uh, Mike Wenner is at DailyDot.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Mike Wenner. Wenner is spelled W-E-H-N-E-R. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having us. Or thanks for having me, guys. Well, the live streaming service Meerkat rolled out several updates this morning. One is called Cameo, which allows a broadcaster to hand over a stream to a follower for 60 seconds at a time. So, for example, when you're broadcasting yourself, you can say, take it away, Kevin Toffel, and then the camera switches to his device for 60 seconds. See? See how, see how well that works? <laughs> we use Meerkat here to do in the studio uh, instead of the multi-million dollar setup that we have installed here. Uh, another is called Facebook integration. And of course, that uses Facebook in a similar way that Meerkat has to date been using Twitter. And a third update is something called the Meerkat Library, which lets you save streams in the cloud instead of on your device. Kevin Toffel, this all sounds like great stuff. It sounds like uh, very, uh, you know, um, common sense and, and useful features for Meerkat. Uh, do you think that this category will continue to survive? Is this a, a viable long-term mainstream category? Is this something on that's going to remain on the fringes for uh, general use? I, I you know, I, I'm not a user of the, of the service at all. So I'll, I'll get that out of the way right off the bat. But I do think there is some stickiness here. This will probably grow and um, attract an audience. I mean, we're broadcasting everything these days. And if you can add more ways to do that, either through, you know, new features such as handing off the, the video feed for 60 seconds to somebody, I mean, that just enhances the experience depending on who you're handing off the broadcast to. So I do see, uh, you know, them pushing the, the boundaries here in terms of uh, how we're all broadcasting everything every day. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, most of these features uh, and most of this capability has been available on Google Hangouts for three years or something like that, uh, but not on mobile. And so... Um, Right now, Google, I think, is suffering uh, the uh, their inability to sort of mobilize Hangouts, uh, which should have happened a long time ago, and they would own this whole category, but no, they didn't. Uh, shame on them. Well, in courtroom drama news, a federal judge canceled a 
$532.9 million damages award against Apple after the company's iTunes software was found to infringe on three patents owned by a Texas patent troll company called Smart Flash. The reason is that the, jury, the judge's jury instructions may have swayed jurors. A new trial to reconsider the damages is set for September 14th in the patent troll capital of the world, Tyler, Texas. Uh, Kevin Tofel, uh, this is kind of interesting. We'll see where this goes. Uh, I don't know how you convince uh, a judge that a judge's instructions to the jury sway the jury, but, uh, but apparently they did it, and uh, they're going to reconsider these charges. I'm, I'm sure Apple is very happy, and I don't really know how this happened, uh, how a judge could have influenced the actual jury, and they're going to have a you know reassessment of the damages. Clearly, there's still going to be damages, um, but in Apple's case, I'm sure they're hoping that they're greatly reduced um, and as you said, this is in Tyler, Texas, which I believe is that's where they, uh, most of these patent cases take place. And a lot of tech companies actually support that town. If it's the town I'm thinking of, Samsung actually has an ice skating rink right across the street from the courthouse, if I'm not mistaken. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. This is a, this is a crazy phenomenon. And, and I think that, uh, that somebody must have written a feature on this. If, if they haven't, they should, because essentially how this works is that Tyler, Texas is very friendly to awarding judgments to patent troll companies. So patent troll companies want to sue there. And in fact, a lot of patent troll companies don't even have buildings or employees. It's just a dude who's buying or, or get, grabbing patents any way they can. They have a P.O. box at the, at the Tyler, Texas post office claim that their company is headquartered there. And then when they file a suit... The, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the people defending themselves have to come from Silicon Valley out to Tyler, Texas, and sit in front of a very patent troll friendly jury every single time. And so uh, it, it's really quite a weird phenomenon. And it, it seems to me like a loophole or a flaw or a problem with, uh, with the system that it exaggerates the flaws in our patent system. The fact that you can cherry pick some little town uh, and, and say, okay, oh, that's the town I want to, you know, uh, sue in. Uh, that's not how the system is supposed to work. Well, a 17-year-old Finn named Julius Kivamaki has been convicted of 50,700 computer-related crimes relating to his membership in the Lizard Squad happy, hack, hacking group, according to the Finnish newspaper Kaleva. Now, you'd think that uh, with 50,000 uh, counts against him and, and guilty on all of them, uh, that he'd uh, be he'd going away for a long, long time. But in fact, he was given a two-year sentence that was suspended. So he was not going to do any time in jail. Uh, Lizard Squad took credit for some of the biggest hacks in recent years, including the DDoS attacks on PlayStation and Xbox networks, and also an impressive attack on the Tor network. Kivamaki was identified in December of 2014 by security journalist Brian Krebs, who's been on this show a few times. Krebs also identified a 22-year-old uh, Brit. Well, there it is, uh, Kevin Tofel. Good thing he wasn't convicted in the United States. Uh, he'd be doing hard time for 20, 20 years at least. <laughs> Yeah, I'm quite surprised that the sentence was suspended. In fact, it was just two years to begin with. I really would have thought, um, given the, the damage and potential loss of income to these companies, um, that it would have been much higher. In fact, I, I remember specifically this past Christmas when the Xbox Live network went down through a, a denial of service attack and uh, people were just so upset. Their new Xbox that couldn't get online, they couldn't play games, they couldn't download anything and parents were upset for their kids and uh, it was just a a terrible, terrible experience for those people. So uh, two years suspended sentence. I'm, I'm really surprised by that. Well, I hope the world's hackers have learned their lesson. Uh, and that lesson, of course, is that if you're going to hack, move to Finland and become a citizen there because there are no consequences. Well, in big, big numbers news, 90 million. That's how many next generation iPhones, a product assumed to be called the iPhone 6S, have been ordered by Apple from suppliers to be manufactured by the end of the year, according to an article in the Wall Street Journal. Now, this is about 10 or 20 million more than the initial order for the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. So this is an impressive number. The article claims sources who add more credibility to the rumor that the next iPhone will offer Force Touch, which is technology currently in the Apple Watch and some newer Apple laptops that allows pressing hard as an actual uh, gesture. I'm a little surprised, Kevin Tofel, that they're going so big on this. I mean... You know, th this is a huge number of phones for the, you know, they have a TikTok cycle for their uh, uh, their their 6S. Uh, I I'm afraid for them uh, that they may have overstretched it. But what do you think? I, I'm going to take the contrary view. I'm not surprised at all. And the reason being, 
Apple for the longest time did not offer something that the market wanted, and that was larger phones. So people went to Android and other devices because they had larger screens and so on. As soon as Apple went to the larger phone sizes and with iOS 8 added much more sharing capabilities and so on to make it what I'll say more Android-like in, in the experience, um, that made some big sales numbers. They had record sales. And you know, not everybody bought that iPhone 6 or 6 Plus last year. Some people would have waited because they, they do wait two years to upgrade. So I think there's a lot of people who will be looking forward to this. And I, I suspect even though they're ordering big and even I heard looking for a third supplier to make the phones, I suspect when they launch this thing, you'll have weights and, and uh, they'll have supply issues uh, like they typically do. Hmm. Well, m my fear is based on two things. One is the fact that, like you said, there was all this pent up demand for a big screen iPhone and then Apple met that dem demand. That means that people who wanted one bought one and they're not going to follow my advice about Gazelle. They're going to hang on to it for two years, possibly, possibly. The other thing is that one of the things that made uh, the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus such a winner was China and China's market has somewhat uh, plateaued in, the, in recent uh, weeks. There's signs that it's finally, finally becoming like a normal country. And instead of, you know, just incredible growth in the smartphone industry, it's kind of leveling off. You know, it's China, so people are still buying lots of phones. But meanwhile, the stock market's crashing in China. Who knows what the economy is going to like, uh, be like? Who knows what people's, uh, I guess we call it consumer confidence in the United States, is going to be like by the time this comes around. So I think it. I, you're probably right. I mean, Apple's just been hitting it out of the park lately, but I just think there are more risks in this one than there were for the last one, and uh, they're going they're going big. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to imagine a bigger number than 90 million uh, for this, given the last one was what 70, 80 million, something like that. Well, keep keep in mind, however, that the report says approximately 90 million phones will be produced by the end of this year. So even if they don't, you know, have a, a massive demand for them. They can cut down on production for the next oh, seven, eight months and still have plenty of inventory. So I don't I don't see it as risky as as you might think because of that. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll uh, we'll regroup at the end of the year and find out uh, what actually happened. Well, the news you can lose a marketing agency called T3 has come out with a Tinder interface for Apple Watch users. Tinder is normally a dating app where you express interest in another person by swiping your finger across the street uh, the screen. But the T3 app lets you choose matches without swiping. The hands-free app monitors your heart. And when a Tinder user makes your heart beat faster, it registers a swipe on the system. Kevin Toffel, need I state the obvious? What if the uh, appearance of the person you see on Tinder scares the hell out of you? That's going to make your heart jump too, but then you're going to be, you know, you're going to express interest. This is a terrible idea. Uh, yeah, that's going to be a fun date. Um, it's like hot or not with uh, with heart rate monitoring. No thanks. You know, and the, you know. Also, if you're using this app while you're walking down the street and a car almost hits you, uh, your heart is going to jump. And you know, that's an, it's another date. What are you going to do? <laughs> they can visit you in the hospital. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Rob Barkey from Sedalia, Missouri, who posted this picture on Twitter. He was watching Tech News today on a train while on vacation. Great place to watch Tech News today. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup or your vacation and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kevin Toffel, what are you uh, writing these days? What are you working on right now? Well, I, I wrote a very popular article apparently on uh, how my iOS 8.4 upgrade hosed my phone and oh, nice. told people how to fix it and got some nice traffic because, you know, these things happen. Uh, you have to do a full reinstall every now and again, and I explained the process for that. And it turns out a lot of people appreciated that, which was great because uh, they had problems too. The phone was running hotter than any other device I've ever used in my life after the upgrade. So um, something went wrong. Wow. And, uh, you know, it can warm your house. Uh, which is nice, but the, you know that is one of the big uh, um, benefits of being a technology journalist like yourself. When you have these horrible problems, you can turn them into uh, your, you know, the product of your career, which is you know your your articles and so on. So, silver lining. Well, thank you so much. We will see you next Wednesday. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Well, you, you can subscribe to Tech News Today on your podcasting app. Always a great place to subscribe. Or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT on our shiny new website. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how to do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media site of your choice. Tag three friends and recommend that they subscribe. You can also join our Google Plus community. 
Just search, search Google Plus for tech news today. You can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. Don't miss tech news tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the tech news today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.